So yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, this is Carol here. I'm the director, one of the directors of Fund Institute Frankfurt, and with me is also Quentin. Um, it's it's been a while since we both sat at the same room to yeah. uh, co-host uh, our sessions, and today we're very lucky to have also Paul here join us. Um, just also to share uh, some logistics, um, feel free to use the chat or function to uh, have some questions. Uh, we are leaving quite a lot of time for Q&A, so please benefit from this time um, to have the interaction also with Bo and get his advice and feedback. Um, Bo is the founder of China Start. He's also a TEDx speaker, and he has, you know, extremely uh, deep experiences uh, on the executive boards of several companies as well, senior uh, in Fortune 500 companies like Monsanto, Cargill, Pfizer, uh, Wrigley, and Mars. And uh, after a corporate career, he decided to, I guess, relaunch, can we say it, or transit into a serial entrepreneur and investor. So he's a Chinese expert and also advocate of uh, EU-China trade. And uh, with this experience for his uh, mentoring and also advising different startups at scale and scale ups uh, in different incubators, accelerators, and holding spaces around the world, and speaks uh, at uh, several international conference conferences as well. So we're very uh, happy and grateful to have him. Paul, thanks for being here today. We would love to have uh, your experience. Um, this is a very important topic for early stage startups who are even planning and thinking about growth as well as uh, not uh, in terms of, you know, expanding the business operations as the next step or even from the first step. And as well as looking for uh, investors who are interested um, to support the local startups ecosystem. So thanks for joining. I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Caroline, for this wonderful introduction. And it's a great pleasure to speak to you and uh, speak at the Founders Institute. So I first wanted to thanks to such an organization that exists to really help the startups, particularly when you're young, you're struggling. The success rate sometimes is not very promising. So I do wanted to encourage you to really, you know, find a new ways of doing things. Now today I wanted to share with you unicorn or dragon. How can early stage founders tap into Chinese market for growth. Now, I speak about this subject around the world in many large international conferences, including the Mobile World Congress. So you're fortunate to be in this seminar. I have to give you this, uh, this uh, assurance. So um, I would like to start with by saying, um, you know, the under US-China trade war. Now we all know there's a trade frictions between US and China. This is inevitable in the process of the power transition, you know, between the two largest nation. And we saw the recent news where Huawei's Meng, Meng Wanzhou, the CFO and daughter of the founder has just been released. Last night, I was having dinner with Huawei European CEO and we speak of, you know, to some extent about this event and as well as the US sanction, European sanction as well. But there's one thing I wanted to tell you. In Huawei's case, there is a, obviously, um, I try to give them some advice in terms of deal with the PR. You know, Huawei actually doesn't possess any risk to US or to Europe. It is more of a political play at this moment. As a result, the European and American consumer are the victim of this event because they have to pay more uh, without Huawei. They have to pay three times more without Huawei. So now you think about who is really behind of all those dramas. So, so as an entrepreneur, I encourage you to look beyond the political argument. You see the US-China trade war here, but what is really happening here is not about politics. You're not politician. You're here to grow your business. Let me share with you the next slide. Despite the trade war, the trade between the US, China, and the rest part of the world actually grew significantly. You know? So the US, first of all, the trade in the first five months in 2021 
there is an increase of 41.3%, you know? And in the first eight months, the US and China are the third largest trading partner, you know, after followed by ASEAN and EU, you know? So all front is increasing. So do not be fooled by politicians. You as an entrepreneur and businessman need to clearly understand. Now in the ancient China, there's a wisdom called the yin yang. You know, whenever there's a yin, there's a yang. Whenever there's yang, there's a yin. So the word is balance, it's a harmony, you know? So we have to understand why you're shaking hand, you're kicking under the table or why you're kicking under the table, you're shaking the hand. So we cannot be the victim of the politicians. We have to drive the change. We have to leverage the fact and leverage the Chinese market. The opportunity actually brought by the US-China trade war is tremendous for Europe. So with the US-China trade war, the American first in the policy, and now China's direct investment in US started to fall, but in Europe started to go up. So China turns to US in Europe, you know, and Chinese innovative company rush to come to Europe as well. So despite US-China trade war, the trade between US-China grew very significantly. So Chinese foreign direct investment, you can see from this chart, UK is 50 billion euros, and uh, the Germany is 22, Italy 15.9, and France is 14.4. So Germany is doing pretty good, could do, could do better. Uh, so UK are very aggressive in you know, building the, the trade partnership with China in the past. You know, they have experienced what they call golden 10 years of the UK-China relationship. So now let me talk about innovation and entrepreneur ecosystem in Europe. Uh, the SM small medium you know enterprise are backbone of Europe's economy. 99% of the business in the EU are SME. You know, they bring tremendous innovation and jobs to the market. And if you look at the in Europe, you know, the 39 European countries rank in top 100 in the global innovation index. You know, if we look at it here, Germany is number 10 and China is number 12. So there is a tremendous need for the German startups and to you know, find a new playground you know, to, to commercialize their products. So if you look at the unicorns from you know, Europe, in 2021, there are 847 unicorns around the world in the US, and this number is 423, and China is 172, Germany only 19. Let me ask you why Germany have only a few unicorns. It's an incredibly innovative you know, country. The reason is very obvious because Germany has, you know, they need to have access over the one large market. So that is a problem facing most of the European startups. That's why I come up with this chart here. The China, the unicorns, you know, is actually you know, not just a lot of unicorn, but also very large size, 2.7 times higher in terms of aggregated value of the top 20 unicorns, you know, versus the US. And, and, and uh, it's 27% higher in terms of valuation, you know, aggregated value, valuation of China's total unicorn is 27% higher. So if you look at the, the, the numbers you understood, if you wanna become a unicorn, even though you are early stage startup, eventually your goal is to become something big. Then China is far more interesting than the United States. You can make it a big unicorn in China. And so this is a very important chart that I created, which will be included in my book, China Start. Now in this chart, you will see Israel is very good at doing from zero to one, you know, developing technologies, right? a new product. And Europe is very good from zero to 10. You know, they're very good at that uh, because Israel doesn't have a market and the Europe does have a market, but not big enough. US is very good from zero to 100. But guess what China is good? China is very good at from 10 to 150 because China has a much bigger market. But what China is not good at it is from zero to 10. That's not the strength of China. So that's why 
well, I say here, Western technology plus Chinese market plus Chinese capital equals to a potential unicorn. Okay, I call them dragon. So it is important to understand this chart and then ask yourself, should we include China as part of our global strategy? The answer is definitely yes. So why China? China has a very strong interest for the Western innovative technologies. And China, you know, have a rising income level. You know, Chinese are very thirsty for the Western technology, particularly made in Germany technology. They love it. And with the rising income, China now are spending more. The consumer market is growing. And finally, China has a great amount of the powerful and risk-taking investors. So the investors in China are very thirsty, ready to invest you know, into the foreign startups. So now let me talk about early you know, uh, startups. When you go to China, one of the first thing you perhaps could consider to do is to find an accelerator in China or incubator or co-working space. Now China has so many, China has so many. You know, even in 1987, they established uh, the first incubator. And now they are just growing exponentially, you know, in terms of high tech, you know, incubators, you know, for that. So, and China's accelerated incubator co-working space, you have some uh, overseas Western, you know, ones which you're familiar with like plug and play. The, fund, uh, the, the owner of plug and play is my student in China. And you have WeWork, Y Combinator, 500 startups. But you also have a lot of Chinese domestic incubator, particularly this one, Touju. The CEO is a good friend of mine and also very strong supporter of China Star program we have. And uh, we work with them very closely. They are the largest you know, uh, you know, incubators in China. They also invest in early startup. And because you, you, you stay there, they understand what is your business and then they, you, they start to invest in you. And also China's, you know, in terms of the, the accelerator and incubator, there are four types. One is the capital, you know, the large, you know, investment firm is setting up and platform driven, which is Beidou, Alibaba, Tencent, JD.com, Amazon, those companies set up their own sort of incubator and value added like Y Combinator, Dark Horse and specialization is based on the industry sector, for instance, like higher. Or, or based on talent like Tsinghua X Lab. Tsinghua is a very well-known you know, uh, engineering university in China. It's like MIT in China. So they have talents. So they set up Tsinghua X Lab to attract the talents to solve some of the pressing issues. You know? So you have so many to choose you know, uh, in, in China. You know? And in my book, China Star will have more you know, in those. And China's angel investment landscape you know, China has a very large investment, you know, ecosystem and Chinese investors are working so hard for that. Some are domestic, some are international brand, but you will find it very interesting from them. They are more risk takers. They are willing to invest in early stage startups. For instance, the China, uh, the Angel Investment Association, I know the chairman of, of, of that association and many of the leading investors there, they're working extremely hard detecting the deals and a lot of time, you know, the early stage startup from Germany um, has already quite good technologies and they will be very interested in, in, doing, in investing in you. How to get investment from China? Know the right people. So you need to have a network of investors. You need to know who is the investor, build a relationship with. In the Chinese culture, people doesn't just invest in you. They wanted to know you. They want to know you through the trusted network. And second, on the right train, if your business is on the right train, then you are more likely to get the investment. For instance, in the past, in 2015, 2016, the sharing economy is everything in China. For instance, you have a, a shared bike kind, you know, company, no matter what kind of you know, it is, and you got funding, you got a lots of money, right? So that's on the train. And now what is the trend? It's artificial intelligence, advanced manufacturing. You know, it is, uh, you know, telecommunication. It's a medicine. You know, there's uh, many, you know, uh, of those new trends in China, you know, renewable energy, you know, green, uh, you know, social innovation is on the rise. 
So those are the train, hottest train. And third, give the right valuation. You know, give the right valuation doesn't mean that you are uh, downgrading yourself. Actually, sometimes you have to, you know, you have you have to properly value yourself. And if you, if if you value yourself too little, and sometimes they will consider you to be lack of confidence and a lack of value. And fourth, get the right policy. You need to understand in China, the policy is very important. Chinese economy is plan economy. And you know, every five years, Chinese government have a new plan. So you have to understand what is your business fitting to that plan. For instance, right now is about climate change, about the environment. The Chinese government very much emphasize on that. Last month, China had a fourth quality conference. In that conference, particularly emphasize on the, the carbon emission, you know, emphasize the climate change, you know, zero emission concept. So if your business is related to that, then you're riding on the policy wave, you know, here. And, and the fifth is you are the right one. Who is the funder? Are you committed? What is your passion? You know, when Jack Ma was looking for money, you know, Jack Ma used to be one of uh, our students. And when Jack Ma was looking for money uh, with Mr. Shun Zhen Yi, and, and he pitched for five minutes because his eyes are full of passion, fire, you know? So the Chinese investor wanted to see you. You're a passionate funder and you believe what you do. And you, for that reason, you have taken a lot of your money to do that. They want to see that, you know, and match the right terms. You know, you need to understand based on what you give to them and what is the term, you know, for, for the Chinese investor is also very important. Yeah. So here I, it's on the right trend, you know, you have semiconductor, which is chips, you know, very interesting AI, intelligent manufacturing, smart city, you know, life science, you know, all those that became very important. Yeah, uh, getting the right people, you know, I will not uh, go through all of those. So now let me talk about their four steps to achieve miraculous growth in China. The first is in-depth understanding of the Chinese consumer. So Chinese consumer behave a little bit differently versus the Western consumer. For instance, uh, the Chinese consumer are very thrift. They always emphasize on price, not just about value. Western consumer are emphasized on value. Chinese consumer emphasize on price. So how can you sell to them? If you're using the, the, the Western you know, uh, sales model, it will not work. So you have to give them discount deals. You know, for instance, uh, some of the Chinese grocery store, you go there, they always have like 20% discount, 30% discount, a big sign there. Why? Because they know consumers like to bargain. And the second is that the local team. Many of you think that I have to work with a Chinese partner. Not necessarily. You, you can establish a local team yourself. There's already a lot of talent in China who speak English and you, they worked for multinational company before. And now they love to work for a startup because then maybe they can get shares, you know. So there's a lot of, you know, STEM talents in China as well. So you don't need to, you know, hire, you know, you, you, you know, to, to, to uh, work with a partner for them. And third, develop the right channel strategy, whether it's e-commerce distributor or franchise or traditional offline channel you have to evaluate each one of them and develop the channel. And finally, create an effective marketing strategy through whether it's offline marketing or the online social media, influencer marketing, you know, for that. So I will skip some of that. But to understand the Chinese consumer, you also need to understand how the Chinese leadership works. You know, in between West and East, there are differences. For instance, you know, Western culture, you know, uh, uh, in terms of relationship is based on equality, merit and the individual ability. But for the Eastern, it's based on mutual benefit, duties and group dynamics. You know, uh, in terms of dealing with, uh, with the conflict, the Western people tend to solve the problem right away, but Chinese seem to avoid the conflict at all costs, you know, which is quite different in our approach. In terms of opinion, the Western, they, they like to debate. But the Chinese, um, they, they like, you know, uh, to represent the leader, to represent the individual in the group. They want to have harmony, uh, you know, alignment, consensus. That's more important, you know, for, for that. 
Okay, so the, um, yeah, I have explained to those, creating the right marketing strategy for instance, whether it's WeChat marketing, Weibo, KOL, big data, or live stream, or influencer, you know, marketing. So influencer marketing, by the way, in China, now become extremely important, extremely important strategies in China for that. So let me give you some case study, you know, the, um, active consumer, you know, uh, so for instance, this is a Spanish company. Um, they, they started to go to China and the most complete suit for the store of the future. And so they, 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 they leverage the existing sort of facility in the store, retail store, and then they personalize using the AI digital signal, you know, uh, methodology. And then they can assist the customers better in terms of, you know, identify the product they are willing to, to, to find, they're, they're, they're interested to find. They engage with the customers through the, the Wi-Fi customer insights and they do the traffic analysis and the content play, uh, et cetera. As a result, they do extremely well. Um, so uh, the key reasons why they go to China is China is the biggest retail market in the world. Um, and the local talents from Chinese universities a lot. Uh, a local authority ready to help ecosystem of the companies and they have capital to invest. Uh, so this is the founder who joined the, our China Star program before. They're very successful in China in helping, you know, addressing that. They started in China in 2012 with local partners acquired 100% of the China subsidiary in 2015. Re remember what I said? They realized that actually why they need to have a local partner. So they acquired them, you know? So, and then uh, uh, they, they invested 20 million RMB. They build a local technical teams with up to 15 people. They have office in Shanghai, Guangzhou, Wuhan, and, and Tongxian. They build a, a Biblo certified partner networks. They build a co-innovation -innov partnership with the Baozun and High Cac Vision and among others. So uh, it's a, they raised the Series A run led by SoftBank, about 70 million RMB. A strategic Chinese investor joined with 50 million and they also invested 20 million in the Chinese business in the next two years. And they co sell co market with the Baozun. So you can see it's an incredibly successful story. I will not, you know, go through all of those, you know, but I wanted to say that to be the next unicorn in China, now it is now. And uh, I also would like to introduce you our China Star program, which is helping you to achieve your dream of, you know, become a potential unicorn in China. The next program is November 3rd to December 3rd. And it's an online program due to the pandemic. And in the future, you can join offline as well. Now there's a one-on-one -on -one meeting with industry experts from Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, TikTok, Fusong, and also two workshops to refine your, your, your you know, pitch and the three Chinese, Chinese unicorn sharing advice and four online pitch events to 100 you know, investors. And China start alumni share market entry tips and finally six interactive you know, sessions on doing business in China. So this is my contacts and thank you very much for listening. Okay, cool. So uh, we are Founder Institute, the Founder Institute. We are the world's largest pre-seed accelerator. You can go to the next slide there. Um, we're in lots of cities all around the world, including Frankfurt, which is where we're located. Uh, and we've helped a lot of companies create a lot of value. You can go next. So we believe entrepreneurs can create real impact on society, but we believe that most startups fail because they lack expert feedback and focus, especially during the early stages. So we created this program to help you get to traction and funding, um, which we found to be the two hardest milestones for early stage entrepreneurs to achieve. And we help you do that through number one, a devoted support network, and number two, a structured growth process. Next one. Our focus is helping early stage founders uh, get attracted funding. I just said that. Um, that includes people who want to launch something. Um, so that could be you, like a founder. Maybe you, you know what you want to do, or maybe you have no idea what you want to do. Um, you might also have a team already and possibly even some kind of prototype or MVP. We've helped all of those people um, get those things set up and get to market and, and get running. Right, next one. Um, our core FI program lasts four months. 
Um, but that's really just a small part of what we do. After the core program, we've built a number of structured post programs, which we call Founder Lab. And those help our alumni get to their next milestones. They're 100% free, 100% virtual. Um, and uh, you also get access to the world's largest network of founders, mentors, and investors to lean on for help, uh, for introductions, uh, and other benefits. Um, here's a list of some of our graduates. Um, altogether, they've raised nearly a billion dollars, US dollars, uh, and over 60 have exited at our last count. Udemy is a really big one. I love that, if you, if you know it. Um, what we do is pretty simple. We find great people. Uh, we give them a devoted support network, and then we put them through a structured growth process. Um, so here's some of the stuff that we do with our core program. Um, we're really trying to help you remove some of the uncertainty and help you to focus on the right things in some kind of sequential fashion. Uh, and that helps you make progress much more quickly. It, it's often overwhelming when you're starting a company. It's not clear what you want to do. And we can help you kind of figure that process out and to focus on the right things. Um, in the program, it's 14 weeks. And each week, you'll be completing aggressive sprints to make real world progress on your business. Um, there's a lot of work around that, but it's not exactly homework. It's really work on the business itself. I just want to emphasize that. Um, you get feedback and guidance each week in feedback sessions with our mentors. Um, so you're not just moving quickly, you're moving smartly. Um, and at these sessions, mentors share some of their best practices, things they've learned along the way. Um, they review your pitch, um, your progress, your strategy. Uh, they help you interpret the data that you're collecting and help you make the right decisions at each step. And here's a bit of an overview of our 14 weeks. If you can kind of read that, maybe tilt your head. Um, each week, there's a feedback session with mentors. We invite usually two experts to present on whatever that topic is. And you can see, for example, customer development or branding and design and try idea review. Um, founders pitch, they get feedback on that pitch. There's networking afterwards. Uh, the two experts will, will present on their area of expertise. Um, and as you move through the program, you build your business, of course. Okay, as an FI alum, after graduation, you get access to our global network, our Silicon Valley portfolio success team, um, many discounts, which are nice, and a great network here in Frankfurt and stretching around the world. Uh, you also get the structured post programs, Founder Lab, which I mentioned, uh, and these programs provide you continuing feedback, and structure to achieve the next milestones in your business. They're 100% virtual, so you don't have to move anywhere, uh, and they're completely free for all our graduates. Um, these are the three programs in Founder Lab. Uh, one is product market fit. So if you're struggling with product market fit, or if that's something that you're focused on, there's a program specifically for that. There's Funding Lab, the one in the middle. This one is about raising either a seed fund or possibly like a Series A fund. So specifically, you know, honing your pitch, finding investors, and going through that process. Uh, and there's another one called Venture Lab, which is more, more based on Series A, like a, a approaching venture capitalists. Um, so almost done here. Um, just a warning that the program is quite difficult. Um, but if you're motivated, if you truly want to get this up and running, um, if you're willing to take feedback, we would really love to have you. And I really encourage you to apply um, right now, just because you're here. Application is free for anybody who attends our events. Um, the course fee is also, we have a special, it's a lower early course fee registration at 699 euros. Um, and that's good until 14 November. After that, the price will go up to the full price, which is 899. Um, and there is a full refund, by the way, if you try it out, we can go three sessions. And if you decide it's not for you, it's 100% money back. So that is it. Uh, I think the main benefit of our program is it will save you time and money that you know, you can do all of this, I guess, on your own if you read enough books and talk to enough people, but it might take you a year or even two or three years, depending on what you're doing. With us, you can do it in 14 weeks. And I think this is really a, a huge benefit. If you're on the wrong idea, I think we can help you figure that out and prevent you from wasting your time. Hopefully we can find a pivot to get you on the right idea. If you're on the right idea, we'll get you up and running much faster. So that's us, that's Founder Institute. Um, there's a really cool uh, kind of personality test that you can do in the application. It's like kind of a founder DNA thing. Um, it's free, so try it out. Uh, I thought it was interesting and uh, I hope to hear from you soon. So that is my pitch. And now we're gonna go to our questions. So we've got quite a list. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that, uh, in fact, uh, we do a lot of, uh, Founder Institute globally does a lot of partnerships and collaboration, you know, with China Start as one. Um, Quentin and I are both graduates from the program, so we advocate because the program has helped us uh, as well. And one of our alumni from uh, our last graduate uh, batch actually completed as well the China Start program. Uh, she's unfortunately at a conference, so she couldn't be here to share her experience. But feel free to reach out uh, if you have any other questions. So uh, 
Well, I think it's uh, it was fascinating. I think you tackled some of the very hard questions that's on everyone's mind right from the start, which I really appreciate. You know, all the negative media between the relationships across cross-border transactions is on everyone's mind. So thanks for addressing it early. Um, very interesting also to hear that, you know, the trade in fact has not decreased, but has increased. And there's a lot of interest now um, in Europe for early stage uh, or even late stage founders. Um, I've seen Nelson has raised your hand. Nelson, what if you would like to say something, we can also invite you here. Nelson is one of our mentors, very active mentors and very supportive um, advocate for our, for our program here in Frankfurt Rhein-Main as well. Um, just let us know. Um, but otherwise, let me start first with the first uh, few questions. Um, for, you know, there are many people thinking about, you know, two things, right? Whether do they start early uh, to go into the Chinese market or, you know, seek uh, investments from the investors who can support with also the strategic growth as well as the capital. Um, what are some of the things that you need to think about before jumping in and making that decision? Yeah, so... Um... I think uh, the first thing they need to think about is whether your business is aligned, aligned with the Chinese market. Um, so by that means that to do a little bit due diligence about, you know, whether you have a chance in China. So not everybody would. For instance, uh, uh, let's say you're, you're in a, a particular sort of uh, 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 mobile game business, which is horror. You know, maybe the Chinese audience or regulation doesn't allow you to operate uh, things like that. Uh, some business, let's say, I mean, gambling business, where, where Chinese government banned the gambling. Um, so uh, this is uh, not not there's not a lot of businesses is in that kind of category that it doesn't work in China. But more importantly, there are businesses that may be more difficult. They have more you know, Chinese strengths. For instance, if you are in the um, artificial intelligence, you know, uh, area, uh, obviously artificial intelligence is very broad scope, now have a very wide, you know, application. Um, you know, you have to map out whether some of the Chinese counterpart is already quite advanced. Uh, if they're already quite advanced, maybe going there, you will face a very strong competition, you know, from them. So you have to be aware of, of those situations. And also understand the, the market needs. So I think I will do a technology mapping and also the consumer mapping before we consider. But if you find that your, your product or technology have a niche in China, have a, have a play in China, then I would encourage you to go there uh, you know, as soon as possible. And because you, you, if you wait for too long, now some people say that, oh, I will wait because if I go there, Chinese is going to copy me, I will finish. Uh, and I tell them that Chinese can copy remotely. So don't worry. They're very good at that. <laughs> so by, by, by holding your head, I mean, Germany, you don't see me. It, it's not the way to go. You have to be proactive. The best way to attack is a market without, you know, consider what do you lose? What do you lose in China? If you go there, at least you get something. If you don't go there, you get nothing. So uh, you go there, be very aggressive. And now intellectual property protection in China is getting much better and better every day. You know, this can be judged with a lot of Western intellectual property lawyers are living in China. Their business is amazing. It's so good. And the core case is that the Western company win in China over the intellectual property dispute. Uh, the, the ratio is higher than in Canada and, and many other Western countries. So this is... This is a miss, you know. The politicians like to say that the China is terrible. They they steal your technology, blah blah blah. This is what politicians say, but reality is a different story. So and and also you go there. Uh, don't expect that uh, you know your technology will 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 never be steal by anyone. This is impossible. This is impossible. That's a dream, you know. Even Apple steal others' technology. They're in the court case almost all year round, right? So um, it's just a way to do business. So, I mean, if, if you want to be completely clean, they, I think the best thing to do is not to start a business and then, you know, find a corporate job. That would be very secure. Uh, so uh, being an entrepreneur, you have to expose to this kind of risk, you know, 
And don't, don't, don't become like a baby sometimes. I call some startup like a baby. Oh, they're going to steal my technology, so I'm not going to go there. You know, this is a baby crying, you know. You have to, you have to fight in a lot of sort of uh, craziness, uh, a messiness. And that's what a true entrepreneur is. It's at the end, yeah. you, you reach to the, to the end of the, the game, right? So not because you reach to the end of game so smoothly, you know, ah, relax. No, reach to the game almost died so many times, but at the end, you, you reach there, you know? That's a fun part of it. So I encourage uh, you to do the following. Sorry, it took yeah. me a while to answer. No, I, I really appreciate that, that answer. I mean, I spent also two years, uh, I'm from Singapore, but I spent two years uh, in Shanghai. And the first six months was, like you said, you jump and then you try to swim. <laughs> and after that, you find supporters, you find the networks uh, to help uh, stay afloat in the beginning and grow uh, exponentially after. Um, I, have, I think this is quite related, this question from Nelson. Uh, he's put it on the chat as well. So he mentioned, you know, you've really touched on some of the risks. Um, are there more other risks to consider? And also how would you um, advise to manage the risks? Yeah, uh, doing business in China has risks just, you know, anywhere else. There are some common risks. There are some specific risks. One of the specific risks is the regulation risk. You know, um, obviously you also have regulation risk uh, in Germany as well. Uh, I can use a recent example of uh, DD, for instance. Uh, DD and among some of the data rich Chinese uh, uh, companies uh, has been sanctioned by the Chinese government uh, for you know, the uh, monopoly and also for the, the abusive use of the data. Uh, so as a result, their stock price uh, dropped significantly. And so this is indeed a risk, you know, and, and also recently the, there's a one Chinese aid tech company uh, called uh, uh, Xindongfang, a new oriental. Mm -hmm. uh, they, because the Chinese government uh, uh, felt that the children uh, in the school system, um, after school, they go to another school because they all want to get better grade. So as a result, they have some, some you know, very, devastating situation, such as the teacher doesn't, doesn't pull their heart to teach well, because they're expecting students will contract them after school to continue to, to learn. Uh, so it's kind of they make some reservation during the class so that they can you know, do more and with extra money involved. So Chinese government overnight decided that this is not good. And also there are a lot of children under so much pressure of learning that they don't have any time belong to themselves. So a lot of sort of suicides and among the teenagers, which is really bad. So the Chinese government decided that no more after school classes, no more, it's illegal. So you know, a lot of company, educational company who are doing this, you know, uh, have the risk, you know, obviously. So uh, you have to understand that Chinese uh, regulator is different from the European regulator. So I wanted to tell you both good and bad. In Europe, I always say that American innovates, Chinese duplicates, and Europe regulates. So European are very good at regulating. You know, in everything you have a law, uh, you know, ever since I live in France, ever since Napoleon, Napoleon is very big fan of the law. So, I mean, in, in France, if you sign a, uh, to buy a, a purchase the house, you have to sign a 400 pages of document, you know? In China, it's just like oh. a few pages of that. So they love papers, they love, you know, regulations. But in France, because you have so many papers, it also doesn't have a lot of dispute down the road. So there's good and bad, right? So uh, in China, they tend to let innovation go. Okay, if you come up with some idea, okay, government is like, okay, cool, let, let you run. Until there's a problem. Then they start to say, stop, stop, stop. This is not right. We see problem. So do you want this model in China, which allow innovation to grow and then sanction and regulate, you know, after problem, problem surface, or you would prefer, you know, like European model, you know, they, they have so many regulations uh, that you just, you find your innovation is very difficult, you know, yeah. and, and, and uh, uh, you cannot move, you know, uh, you, if you want to move one inch, it takes so much effort. 
so it's a different school of thought, you know, for that. So there are regulation risks in China, you know, for that. And the second risk I would say um, uh, would be <clears throat> uh, the uh, uh, what, what I would say the market risk because uh, there is a rapid change in the market condition, perhaps more rapid change in the market condition than in the Europe. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the, the consumers may very quickly abandon certain you know, items just because some influencer says it's bad and then all of a sudden, because Chinese society is a more collective society. So they, are, they listen to the leaders uh, in the Europe, you know, consumers have their own opinion. They feel that they're an individual with their own intelligence, right? They make their own decision. I use one example. You know, in, I live in France, I mentioned to you. you now, in France, if you saw a girl uh, who, uh, your colleague, who by, let's say, uh, I'm a girl, you know, I go to the office, saw my colleague bought a very beautiful dress, you know, come to work, wear it, and you will say, oh, you know, it's so, so beautiful, you know, um, blah, blah, blah. But then uh, inside of you, you will say that it's so beautiful. Gosh, I can't buy anymore because you bought it. I'm not going to wear the same as you do, right, to come to work. But in China, if one girl come to the office with this beautiful dress and everybody liked it, and the next day everybody will wear the same. It's <laughs> like a uniform. Yeah, because the Chinese culture is very much influenced by this influencer, you know? So influencer could be anyone, you know, could be your friends, coworkers and things like that. So that's why the market condition in China could change so rapidly. You know, in Europe, it's, it's relatively stable, but in China, maybe there's a new trend come over and then the old, old stuff is all gone, you know? So overnight, so, so they have this kind of hard effect in China. So that makes the Chinese market uh, sometimes uh, more risky, you know, uh, for that. But in general, I would say that it's like in any other country, you know, even though uh, the Western politician like to call China uh, a sort of communist country, but I can, I have to tell you, uh, if you've been to China, live there, you know, it's very market driven. It's very much market driven. Uh, and uh, you, you can, you can, uh, many product, as long as you have a market, it will flourish there in China. I appreciate it. And, and I, I do see that some of the regulations is really also looking at the impact on society, which I appreciate. Going back to the education uh, one, it's also to avoid the lower income or middle income families um, spending a large proportion of their income on private yeah. tuition, uh, which I appreciate. Um, so thanks for sharing the different risk uh, financially as well as uh, regulatory uh, market risk and regulations. Um, I have a question right um, So you mentioned the importance of, of local knowledge, of course, right? That you have to know your market when you go in there and, and China has some significant differences from Europe. So of course we have to know what we're doing. Um, what have you seen uh, from successful companies that have, European companies that have gone into China that maybe don't have a Chinese co-founder or real experience in China? How have they built that up? How have they figured that out? Have they partnered or can you, can you talk about those strategies? Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, it's uh, as an entrepreneur, you know, I always refer to Marco Polo, you know, in the, in the, uh, the thir 13th century. He went to China. Uh, he doesn't even know where is China, but he, he decided to go. You know, uh, he doesn't speak Chinese. He doesn't know whether he can return with his head on his body. You know, I mean, he's a true entrepreneur. He went there, you know, for that. So, um, so China is... is at his time, China is about two years away from, you know, Italy, from, you know, uh, you know, but, but, but now China is a few hours away, you know, 10 hours, you know, 12 hours away. So um, to answer your question, uh, you, 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 you try to reach to the Chinese, uh, you know, consumer understanding uh, their needs, it's relatively easy. It's uh, you just uh, do some research and uh, uh, the best way I always tell you is uh, just go there for three months, you know, uh, go there for three months and uh, find an incubator and reside there and uh, start to, uh, after 24 hours, you know China far more than the, you know, your whole life, you know. And then if you live there for three months, you know pretty much everything. 
And you don't need to have a Chinese co-founder. You know, uh, sometimes it's a problem to have a co-founder that is Chinese because then you have a different opinion who is right. The Chinese co-founder is going to say that I'm Chinese, I'm here. So you listen to me, shut up. You know, what do you do? Yeah, he, he said he's right, he's Chinese. But being Chinese doesn't mean he's always right, right? So that's why I always say that, you know, just uh, go there yourself, fight, you know, there. And then you leverage a lot of people. There's a lot of Chinese who are willing to help you, who are free, willing to help you. You reside an incubator, you go dinner with them, you know, you go to cinema with them, and then you ask them during the movie, you know, uh, you know, what should I do with them? They, they give you all their sort of, you know, experience. So I think it is the best way. I, I'm, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not, not going to lie to you. A lot of textbooks say, oh, find a partner and, you know, co-finder. Now, this is all stupid answer, I have to say. You, you can go there and fight alone because you know your business. What, what you don't know, you can hire an employee. You hire, a, 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 let's say, general manager uh, who have all this functional knowledge and also Chinese connection and all that's plenty enough. Right? You give him some share and then he's motivated and he's, he, will, he will work very hard for that. So why you need a co-founder to, to have the same power? The key he thinks here, you have to have control of your company. You need to have the power. And if you lose the control of your company, then that would be a disaster. And then you will be out of the door. And then your company is still running in China, but you're no longer running the company. You know, that would be the most devastating situation. For sure. There is a follow-up question from Nelson uh, and then also a question from Lucas. So I thought I'm going to just uh, read them out. Uh, Nelson is asking, are capital and profits made, uh, can we take them out of, the, of China? Oh, that's a very good question. So whether the money can move freely from China to outside of the China, that's a very uh, important question. Uh, the answer is yes, but it will take some sort of work. There are companies who can specialize in doing that. Uh, I actually have a student who, uh, I mean, when I say student, they are chairman CEOs. Okay, my students are very well established. Uh, Jack Mai is one of them. So they, they are uh, able to help you to do that, um, apply for the uh, permit, uh, so, you know, because you're the owner, the, the, the owner of the company, so they will uh, assume, uh, you know, you, you have to take the money out, out of the country. So this is a possible, but need some structures uh, to do that. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, the question from Lucas, Lucas says, thanks for the insight on going to China, but there's a huge market size of Chinese individuals to address within Western countries. Are there any particular thoughts on targeting Chinese individuals who live in Western European countries? I assume you mean the Chinese uh, population or market that is residing here. Yeah. I didn't quite understand the question. I think what he meant was there is a huge population of Chinese or, or Asians uh, living in Europe. Should we probably target them? Uh, yeah, it's possible. Thoughts? Yeah, it's possible to target at overseas Chinese. There's a lot here. I know some of the companies to target them, the overseas Chinese, and also tourists who come to Europe, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for that matters. Uh, there are, uh, and also Chinese students who study here in Europe, um, you know, for that matters. And it's getting, you know, if we combine all those Chinese who live in Europe all together, and plus the tourism itself is a European country. So uh, why not? It's possible to do that. That's good. Uh, Lisa says, uh, thanks for the nice example regarding Marco Polo. <laughs> Very encouraging. Um, I want to move the conversation a little bit from growth to funding. Well, it's also part of the growth strategy. Um, what are some advice when we look into fundraising? So for example, what do Chinese investors typically look for when they invest in European early stage uh, pre-seed seed uh, founders? Uh, you know, when they are looking at, they're looking at promises sign. They're looking at whether this is new enough to disrupt the industry. And they're also looking at the potential, whether this can become something really uh, important. And also they're looking at whether they can help them to, uh, to, to achieve a certain milestone within their ecosystems of resources. 
So these are the general things that they are uh, looking at. It's great, it's great. Um, but they, obviously they are also looking at the, the funder. The funder became extremely important and also the team, the team they have, the co-founders is very important. So one of my friend uh, who is a very famous Chinese uh, angel investor, and he, he wrote a book uh, it called, if I give you 1 million, what can you do? So basically that's a book. So um, his point is that it's not about money, guys. You know, as a, as a startup, you always think, oh, if what, only if I have, you know, 1 million, I will just change the world and I will just make something amazing. And he said, no, you're wrong. So it's not about money. It's about your business model. It's about you. So uh, he has a very weird sort of approach to interview the funder. Whenever someone comes for investment, he has some interest, he's going to say, let's have a cup of coffee. So he took him, uh, took him or her to the Starbucks coffee. And then he will, he will watch uh, what, what kind of clothes the, 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 the funders wear, you know, the way the funders talk and what, if, what is important for them. And he have some sort of toxic questions for them. You know, you find what kind of car you drive, you know, what kind of places you live, blah, 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 blah. And then he told me that if someone still drive a Mercedes and then asking money from me, and I will never give money to these kind of people. He said that they should sell Mercedes. And then if someone tell me that, well, I so believe what I do, I sold all my stuff, you know, but I, I have nothing left. And, and, but I really believe it. So that's why I need money. Then he said that this guy is very sincere because he, he first invests himself into his company. And if someone live a comfortable life and hoping someone will invest in him, he said, maybe he doesn't quite believe what you do. So, I mean, this is an extreme case. I'm not saying that every investor looking at this, but you know, I'm, I'm saying here, investor wanna see your commitment, your passion, you know, uh, from an early stage, you know, to see whether you really believe what you do, because a lot of a lot of the startups, what they do is that, OK, I have 10 different ideas. Let's try this. If it works, we do it. If it doesn't work, we move to another one. So they fail like so many times and eventually getting nowhere. So as an early startup, you wanted to make a determination, commitment to one direction that you so believe that you're willing to spend the rest of your life to crack this nuts, okay? So this kind of conviction is what the early stage investor in China are looking for. I love that, I love that. And I, I was, uh, I had the privilege to be part of uh, some of the discussions, understanding how, how a large corporate VCs are looking into Europe. And I think they, one of the things that came out from this discussion was that they are even interested to Co in, or, or invest or co invest uh, super early on. They don't really care in the beginning of, um, of, of you know, of the details, in fact. Uh, and yeah. then later on, because the valuation is very, support. Yeah, valuation is very difficult. So, I mean, as early on, you say your company worth 1 million or worth uh, uh, 1.5 million, it's irrelevant. You know, for early, early investor, they also don't care so much about that because. Uh, what they're looking for, you know, is uh, a very big uh, upside. And they also understand many of the investment they, they put will fail. Only a few, maybe 10% succeeded. They hope that 10% will succeed big. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great insight. Um, so I'm just, aware of- For this Sorry. one point, I just wanted to bring some insights to early stage investors. If I would be you, if I would be you, let's pretend I'm your, your, your you, okay? So um, I'm gonna just, you know, for the sake of going to find this investment, I'm gonna be so passionate in talking about my business. I'm gonna be like, so, you know, like I'm so emerged in my world that, you know, how big this business opportunity is, how much effort we put together, you know, you need to give the investor this impression. I'm not saying you try to make up the story. If you truly don't believe, then don't, don't be like an actor or actress. But you know, if you are, put extra effort 
So I, I have a, a sort of a workshop called a, a investment pitch workshop. And I wrote a book about that as well, called Three I, you know, uh, you know, value based uh, public, uh, you know, pitch uh, uh, methodology. So I encourage everybody to sit into that course uh, because it's going to do you justice. You're going to become a fantastic, you know, person looking for investment. Almost every single time you're going to impress people and getting investment, you know, for that. So we as an individual need to touch people. We cannot be just ordinary. If you're ordinary you know, entrepreneur, stop there. That's not for you. You have to be extraordinary. You have to be special. You know, you're not just special for other people. You have to feel special yourself. You know, you are the best. You know, if you don't have this feeling, you, how could you convey that feeling to others? That would be a problem to do that, right? So you have to have this passion every day. You know, I live a passionate life. Every day I feel so excited about my life. If you're not about your business, there's something wrong there. That's a fundamental problem you have to address before you think about something else. Yeah, I think that's a good way then to round up the session. Thank you so much. I, I understand that there are, I think, two questions not answered, but we try to find a way to um, send them over to you, Paul, if you would like to address them later on. Would really appreciate it. Uh, so, Lucas Nelson, I'm, I'm just going to consolidate the questions and then uh, try to share it afterwards offline. But thank you for your time, Bo. It's been extremely inspiring. I think the last point you made, especially, I think, touches the hearts of founders who find it, you know, sometimes there are great days and days that you want to sleep over <laughs> and wake up and hopefully makes it feeling great again. But uh, looking into the passion and the mission is, is extremely, extremely important, even for Founder Institute with the mission to build. Um, yeah. Uh, companies that are impactful and also enduring. So thanks once again, and it was a pleasure to have you. And thanks everyone here for joining. Um, take a look into the China Star program, into the Funding Institute Frankfurt or wider uh, European region uh, programs as well. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions and then we see you soon for the next session. Thanks, Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Take care, bye. Take care, bye.